uh, he's been at the BHI for the last year. Right, but uh, still yeah, you can say some words about him. Well, I think he's gonna give a very nice and interesting talk mm -hmm. on, uh, on a possible solution to the cosmological constant problem uh, that is, uh, 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 well, it's, it, it, it's my kid. Um, that is uh, uh, going to be very interesting and 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 uh, different than, than many other scenarios that people consider. So let, let's, uh, without further ado, uh, listen to Kevin. Uh, okay, so thanks, Paul. Ahead, Kevin. Yeah, thank you. So let me let me share my screen. Uh, but... Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So um, I want to take this uh, this opportunity of well having a, such an interdisciplinary audience to to talk about a subject that is also uh, interdisciplinary, um, namely the cosmological constant problem. And I hope that uh, uh, well, that this will trigger some interaction because. Um, there are so many connections uh, between the cosmological constant problem and uh, other, well, and all fields of modern theoretical physics that uh, it's very interesting to, to hear about uh, various uh, viewpoints. So um, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to uh, describe a scalar tensor model of gravity whose main uh, interest is that it, uh, it has Dositor attractor solutions. And the uh, Hubble expansion rate of these attractor solutions is not correlated with the value of the uh, cosmological constant or with the value of uh, vacuum energy. So this offers the possibility uh, to at least alleviate the cosmological constant problem, since uh, you can have slow Hubble expansion, even if there is a very large vacuum energy, as naturally expected from, uh, from QFT and from particle physics. Uh, so this is work uh, done in collaboration with my former uh, PhD co-advisor, Oleg Evni. Um, so let me okay let me give you uh, the outline. So I'm gonna like briefly uh, well recall what the cosmological constant problem is. Uh, then I present the the model, the scalar tensor model. Uh, I'll explain uh, what are these attractor solutions and how it uh, it may help uh, the cosmological constant problem. Uh, I will also discuss the naturalness of this model in contrast to uh, naturalness in, in the lambda CDM model of cosmology. Uh, then, uh, okay, I, up, up to that point, it's a very simple model of cosmology uh, where matter is not considered, so it's empty universe uh, with some uh, vacuum energy and with some non minimum uh, non-minimally coupled uh, scalar field. And uh, in order to, well, uh, explore whether this kind of model has any chance of uh, being phenomenologically uh, viable, uh, I will comment on uh, what we can expect uh, well, in a more complete model where we also include matter and where we study uh, the cosmological history, uh, and I'll end with uh, some future directions. Uh, so if you have any question uh, at any point, please, uh, please interrupt me. Okay, so the cosmological constant problem, uh, as, you, as you all know, is the tension between uh, observation, cosmological observations of the Hubble expansion rate and uh, well, theoretical expectations of what vacuum energy uh, should be uh, 
well, based on a QFT and particle physics. So, uh, so at the at the at the level of, of QFT and particle physics, um, one can compute vacuum energy, and in principle, there are uh, many contributions. So, first of all, there is a bare contribution uh, that you can identify with the cosmological constant uh, in the Lagrange of the theory. Uh, this is a free parameter that you can tune. And uh, then you have, uh, you have uh, radiative corrections coming from uh, quantum field fluctuations. And basically, any massive field will contribute to, uh, to that cosmological constant. So there is a comment in the chat. Oh, uh, is everyone hearing me? Paul is saying that I'm breaking up. Okay, it's probably just my my internet. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so there are those quantum fluctuations, and every massive field uh, contributes to that. Uh, then you have also uh, other contributions that may come from uh, phase transitions during the universe history. So there is. Uh, spontaneous breaking of the electric uh, symmetry, and you have a VEV associated to that. And then in QCD, um, there is a breaking of chiral symmetry, and you also have uh, a VEV uh, associated to that. So although it's very difficult to compute uh, all contributions, uh, I mean, it, it may even not be possible. Uh, it's very difficult, uh, so we don't know exactly the precise values of those contributions. Um, but we know what are their scale, the scale, uh, the energy scale of uh, each contribution. Um, and we can also, so uh, in the context of the lambda CDM uh, model of cosmology, there is a direct relation between vacuum energy and the uh, Hubble expansion rate uh, at late time. And we can infer that uh, we can infer the energy scale of uh, vacuum energy from observations of the Hubble expansion rate. And it's given in uh, particle physics units by this energy scale 10 to the minus 12 uh, giga electron volt. And what is striking is that this number uh, is essentially smaller than any of the contributions that we see in this sum uh, that we that we can compute in in QFT. So, how is that possible that uh, this term is so small while uh, those contributions seems uh, very large? Uh, so, for example, uh, the electroweak. Uh, energy density should be of the order of the Higgs mass. So it should be uh, one, uh, 100 giga electron volt. So it's, it's much larger than this 10 to the minus 12. So various possibilities. Uh, one, there is fine tuning between the various contributions. Actually, you can, you can do that by hand. You can, uh, <clears throat> can fine tune this free parameter here such that the whole sum cancels up to uh, this small piece. So that's one possibility. But um, it seems very unnatural and very unsat unsatisfactory. So we can also look for uh, a theory uh, beyond the standard model uh, that would, whose symmetry principle would uh, would enforce uh, such a small bag. And actually, so supersymmetry, one of the reasons people uh, started studying that is that in that uh, theory, vacuum energy is precisely zero. And at that time, it was not clear that uh, vacuum energy was non-zero. So it was a very nice uh, uh, prospect. Uh, but now we know. Uh, well, two things, vacuum energy is non-zero and uh, supersymmetry is not realized, at least uh, the unbroken phase. 
So, um, okay, we need something else. <clears throat> um, so a third possibility that I want to talk about is uh, the possibility that uh, there is a dynamical uh, attractor that drives the state of the universe towards a slow Hubble expansion rate as the one we observe, although uh, there may be very large uh, vacuum fluctuations. Um, as naturally expected in uh, QFT. So that's that's what I want to focus on. So uh, the model that we uh, that we look at is the very simple scalar tensor theory, where uh, in addition to the Einstein-Hilbert action, uh, you also have a massive scalar field phi that is non-minimally coupled to uh, Ricci curvature. Uh, so there are two non-minimal coupling terms. So this model looks uh, very natural from a, an EFT perspective. Uh, it's just a bunch of uh, polynomial uh, interactions. And what we need uh, within that model in order to, to achieve a dynamical adjustment mechanism is the, are the following ingredients. Uh, so we need a uh, negative non-minimal coupling psi. And the reason is that uh, with uh, negative uh, coupling, um, the, the scalar field will be unstable close to, um, well, to, to, its, uh, to, the, to its origin, to, to, the, to its zero value. So it will naturally um, develop uh, well, it will naturally develop growing solutions and uh, develop a negative energy density that will slowly or very rapidly, in this case, uh, compensate for the large uh, vacuum energy produced by uh, quantum fluctuations. And uh, we, we also want the potential to be bounded from below, the, the phi potential to be bounded from below. So that's why uh, we have those quartic uh, couplings here. Uh, so what will happen is that, well, I will comment on that uh, in a minute, but the scalar field rolls down its potential uh, because of the non-minimal uh, coupling psi, uh, but then stabilizes to some constant value. Why not? Uh, and this is the attractor solution. And finally, we, we need a hierarchy uh, of coupling between those, those uh, in interaction terms, so the dimensionless mass uh, the, and the quartic couplings. So these must be much smaller than the non-minimal coupling side. And the reason we want that is that we want uh, this uh, growing period to last long enough uh, in order to cancel uh, almost all of the of the uh, vacuum energy. Um, <clears throat> so, as I told you, there are attractor solutions to this model um, with constant uh, field and constant Hubble expansion rate, and what we want is that the Hubble expansion rate measured in Planck units uh, is this very small number, 10 to the minus 120, which is the, 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 the measurement uh, scale. So that's the goal. Um, so picturally, uh, the, so the, the, the mechanism uh, is the following. So you have the, initially, you, you, you have your field uh, sitting, um, sitting here. Uh, and because of the negative non-minimal coupling, uh, well, there is, uh, well, this point is, is unstable. So the field will start uh, rolling down uh, its potential, which is the, the black uh, curve. Um, and as it rolls down the potential, the energy density uh, decreases. 
So uh, initially, there is a very large energy density. It may be of the order of the electroweak scale or even Planck scale. Uh, but the point is that uh, it decreases uh, well along the evolution of the system. And because the energy density, the total energy density decreases when you solve a Friedman equation, assuming uh, well, homogeneity and isotropy, so you only solve for the scale for this uh, scale factor a. Um, you you see that the the curvature uh, decreases in response to that. So that means that the potential uh, flattens because here in the potential, there are terms uh, that depend explicitly on the curvature. So eventually, um, the scalar field will settle down to the moving minimum of the potential. Uh, and then the system will be uh, time independent. So will be stationary. Um, and this happens uh, for a value of the remaining energy density that is very small compared to the initial uh, vacuum energy. OK, uh, so here, OK, this description is uh, quasi static, but if you if you solve explicitly the time dependent uh, equations of motion, um, you, you end up in that uh, in the, in the, in that uh, state. It's just that you have also friction terms and stuff like that. Okay. <clears throat> so um, well, here is a table that that describes uh, the attractor solution. Uh, for various choices of uh, parameters in the model. So those parameters are uh, these uh, interaction terms. And as I said, we need those guys to be much smaller than the non-minimal coupling side. And there are various ways to arrange for, uh, well, for this hierarchy. So you have subregions in the parameter space uh, where you can uh, uh, well order differently the <coughs> the parameters the, their uh, their their own size and then you can read off in each subregion of the, par the interesting parameter space uh, what are the uh, the characteristics of the attractor solution so what, what is really of interest to us is that quantity because that's the observable. Um, and basically you see that uh, generically, it's the ratio of the quartic coupling to the non-minimal coupling uh, xi. So if this ratio is very small, if it's 10 to the minus 120, uh, then you, you may be able to um, well, to account for the observations. Uh, so we see that in this model, we trade the fine tuning uh, of lambda to a hierarchy of uh, couplings in the Lagrange. And uh, the question is, uh, does this help uh, alleviate the cosmological constant problem? And I'm gonna argue that it does. Uh, in a minute. But first, uh, I'm going to just uh, show you some, uh, some plots of the uh, system evolution. Um, so these dashed blue lines are the attractor values. And you see uh, how the field and how the Hubble uh, expansion rate approaches that value. So the three different lines are for uh, three choices of parameters. Um, and depending, so this is in region three of the parameter space. Uh, there are five regions. 
depending on the region in parameter space, you can have various approaches to these uh, attractor solutions. So in particular, in, in, in that uh, region, you see that the approach is uh, oscillatory while in the region three it's uh, rather smooth monotonic um, so this may lead to to different physics um, although i i i haven't uh, thought about it much but it's maybe nice to keep in mind okay so now let me uh, comment on the naturalness of this uh, of this model. Essentially, the question is whether there is any improvement on uh, the fine tuning. So the problem with the uh, a small cosmological constant uh, in the Lagrangian of um, well, of, of gravity is that the the radiative corrections um, depend very much on the cutoff uh, energy scale of the theory. If you see the if you see gravity as an effective field theory, and in fact it's it's very sensitive to the cutoff. So um, the problem is that the radiative corrections are actually of the order of the cutoff energy scale which are so it, it's very difficult to understand why the the observed physical value is so small if you have so, such uh, uh, radiative corrections that are so big but it's it's not the case in this model because here the small parameters that we need basically those quartic couplings uh, they're very stable under uh, radiative corrections so here are uh, some schematic computations of uh, radiative corrections to the mass here, to the mass of the scalar field, and to the quartic interaction. And you see that, well, they are very small, basically because to compute these radiative corrections, you have to insert uh, an, uh, a, a vertex here, and this vertex is of order lambda. So what you can do, um, well, you can compute the, the radiative correction uh, to the mass, for example. Uh, you find uh, well, this simple expression, and you see that this is smaller than lambda. So it's uh, very small. And you can read this in another way. You can say, OK, uh, what does this say about the cutoff energy scale of this effective field theory? Uh, to up to which energy scale this theory is valid? And for that, you can just uh, ask the following: uh, When does up to which uh, cutoff energy scale is the radiative correction to the mass smaller than the three-level value? And uh, this gives you a constraint on the cutoff energy scale. So in particular, here we see that the cutoff energy scale in Planck units must be smaller than this ratio. And in some regions of the parameter space, this is, this is smaller than, uh, this is bigger than one. So your cutoff can be up to the Planck scale. Uh, in some other regions of the parameter uh, of the par parameter space, this quantity is uh, smaller than one, and then the cutoff uh, energy scale of the theory is uh, lower than the Planck scale, which is not uh, an issue. Um, and probably the the takeaway or the requirement that we need for the model to be uh, natural and for the couplings to be relatively stable is that we need the uh, theory to only break very softly the shift symmetry of phi. Uh, the reason for that is that um, because those small couplings, they come 
uh, well, they, they are in front of uh, of interaction terms of phi. Any radiative corrections to these couplings uh, must also involve uh, phi. So if all couplings in the theory uh, that involve phi are small, uh, then you cannot generate large radiative corrections. So that this summarizes uh, well, what we need for the theory to uh, to be natural. Um, okay. Um, so in the so how how am I doing with time? Actually, I don't know. Um, okay, so for the uh, remaining of the talk, sorry. Uh, I'm gonna. So this this was a, a very simple model. Um, there was no matter, so it's difficult to tell whether uh, this is phenomenologically viable. And so we can ask the following question, what happens to the model if we put matter in? And in particular, is it consistent uh, with the history of the universe as we know it? So <clears throat> what we have in mind here, um, or what I'm going to assume is that the, um, uh, the attractor mechanism uh, operates very early in the universe. Actually, it can be the, the time scale that it needs to, uh, to reach the attractor can be computed. It's less than 10 to the, 10 to the minus 15 seconds. Um, so the approach actually is, is exponential to this uh, attractor solution. So it's uh, consistent to assume that this happens very early in the universe. And then once this attractor is uh, reached, one can ask whether um, it's consistent with the subsequent uh, cosmological evolution. So, here we assume that the attractor has been reached. For simplicity, I'm gonna uh, focus on uh, these values of parameters and, and, and lambda uh, equal to zero, because this will be the best case uh, scenario as you will see in a minute. Um, and then I add matter. So uh, I add standard matter that is minimally coupled to gravity can be radiation, it can be cold dark matter, uh, cold matter, sorry, non-relativistic non matter. Um, and, uh, and I look at the evolution of uh, the cosmological evolution. One thing that has to be kept in mind is that it's a scalar tensor theory of gravity. So that means that the uh, physical, physical um, gravitational strength is not given by the uh, Newton constant that appears in the Lagrangian, but it's modified by the non-minimal uh, coupling terms. And in particular, uh, once the attractor solution is, uh, is reached, uh, this, this is the, uh, the value of uh, the physical and gravitational strength. And what we see is that the effective Newton constant is much smaller than the uh, bare one that appears in the Lagrange. So this model could also give a hint at why gravity is so, is so weak. Um, okay, then, as I told you, we were looking at uh, cosmological evolution. So for simplicity, uh, I look at the Friedman equation. I still have my so I uh, so this this uh, term here accounts for uh, vacuum energy generated by uh, quantum fluctuations, so it's very large, maybe Planckian. Uh, here is the negative energy density of the scalar field, 
And here is some additional uh, matter content. And I assume that the attractor solution has been reached. Um, now, I can plug in what this, uh, this quantity is. And the miracle is that you can, so it's proportional to a square, to the Hubble, uh, Hubble expansion square. So you can uh, move it to the other side of the equation. And then you divide by whatever constant appears in front. And what you find is this equation where now uh, instead of the Berger Newton, we have the physical one. And instead of this huge vacuum energy, we have this uh, well, effective one where you also take into account the, uh, the, the, the non minimally coupled uh, scalar field density. So it looks exactly like the Friedman equation we're used to. So we know that the solutions are identical to those that we, that we like. And you can also ask, well, here you assumed that uh, phi uh, is constant. So that, I mean, phi uh, reached the attractor. What happens uh, if you slightly um, perturb this, this attractor value? What happens to the system? So if you do that, uh, you can look at what is the equation of motion for this uh, uh, scalar fluctuation. Uh, it's simply given by, uh, so it's simply the equation of a harmonic oscillator uh, that is damped. So this is the, the friction term. And uh, it has positive mass because psi is negative. So that means that uh, it's exponentially damped on the time scale of the Hubble expansion. Uh, so well, this tells you that the attractor solution is still an attractor, uh, even when you put in uh, matter fields. OK. And uh, in addition to, to, to this uh, uh, very simple uh, analysis, is that um, the post-Newtonian parameter that you, that you may compute uh, in that scalar tensor uh, theory of gravity is exactly the one of GR. So this uh, gamma uh, this post-Newtonian parameter gamma is one, which is also uh, in agreement with uh, GR. So there is actually no, once the attractor sets in, there is actually no difference between, well, there is a slight difference, but uh, at the level of this parameter, there is no difference. So that means that, uh, the model uh, is in, in agreement with uh, uh, solar test um, system, uh, solar, test, solar, solar uh, system test of uh, gravity. Okay, um, so that's basically uh, all I wanted to say. Let me um, let me summarize. So we proposed a very simple scalar tensor theory uh, that uh, has the, the interest of uh, having attractor solutions that are the sitter uh, and have um, small Hubble expansion rate if there is a hierarchy of coupling in the model. The Hubble expansion rate, the late time uh, Hubble expansion rate is actually uh, is not correlated to uh, the initial vacuum energy that you may have in the system. And so it, uh, it achieves a dynamical adjustment of the, of the Hubble expansion rate. Um, it's technically natural in the sense that 
uh, as an effective field theory, the smallness of those uh, small well, of those coupling parameters is not spoiled by uh, radiative corrections. Uh, in contrast to uh, to the lambda CDM model with a small cosmological cost. And uh, then we can ask what are the, the next steps? Um, <clears throat> so in the previous slide, I told you that the model was uh, basically indistinguishable from GR uh, for the choice of parameters where uh, the mass and the quartic coupling uh, is zero, the quartic coupling lambda is zero. Um, but we can we can ask uh, what happens when this choice is not made? Uh, is it still consistent? So that's uh, some some work uh, that we that we started recently with um, a, a grad student in uh, Montreal. Uh, Victor Massa, that is with us, I think. Um, and um, and we can ask uh, about other uh, phenom phenomenologi phenomenological um, uh, constraints on the model. Uh, what's, what happens during during phase transitions uh, in the universe history? Um, where to put inflation in that story? Uh, that's something I, I have no clue at the moment, uh, for which I have no clue. Um, and then, uh, because the model is so simple and generic, you can imagine many, uh, many modifications, many generalizations. Uh, you can you can <clears throat> replace the the scalar field by a spinner field, a higher spin field. You can put many uh, many fields. You can try to embed uh, this effective field theory into some uh, more UV complete theory. Uh, so there are many, many open uh, directions. And OK, with that, uh, well, I, will, uh, I will end. So uh, please, if you have any, any question, I, I would be any question or comment or um, even a strong ob objection. It's also uh, very welcome. Thank you for that for, for that nice talk, Kevin. Uh, I, I do have one one question. Uh, when we were talking about radiative corrections, yes. Um, if you want to say that instead of just putting the classical stress tensor on the right hand side of Einstein's equations that I, I really want to put the, the full expectation value of the stress tensor and, and, and think about the, 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 the quantum field theory as being quantum mechanical and general relativity being classical. Does, yes. this, theory, does this theory remain stable in that setup? And I, I ask that because most quantum theories uh, uh, that I know of, at least, they, they don't remain stable when they're coupled to gravity. Um. What, what do you have in mind? What, what kind of... Uh, so I'm asking if, if instead of the classical stress tensor, yeah. you put in the expectation value of the stress tensor in the quantum theory. Right, right. So actually, that's how, uh, that's how we started thinking about that. Um, so at first, I, I wanted to, to, uh, to put the expectation value of the stress tensor on the, on the right-hand side. And uh, then I quickly realized that um, in case where you have uh, this non-minimal coupling that is negative, the zero mode dominates. So the classical part of the stress tensor dominates, if you, if you, if you want, um, because it's the one that grows uh, faster. So, so there are no exponentially growing modes other than the, other than the classical work. Uh, there are, there are, but uh, the, the the zero mode is the is the dominant one. So, in principle, you can also add uh, 
like uh, other uh, well you can you can you can compute the the expectation value of the stress tensor including uh, all modes um, and these will also contribute they will they will uh, actually uh, strength strengthen the the mechanism but the, the zero mode is the, is the dominant piece Further questions for Kevin? All right then. Well, thank you again, Kevin. That was very nice. Yeah. Th thanks a lot. Okay. Yeah, I I I was hoping that uh, this would trigger some some more questions, but. It's fine. So I guess um, we'll see you next week then. Um, Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Stay safe, everyone. All right. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.